Um, thank you everyone for joining this conversation with SVP today about um, early childhood care and education. We have some amazing panelists. And um, first to get started, uh, I am really thrilled to introduce our my newest colleague at Social Venture Partners, uh, Monisha Gibson. Monisha is our, yes, I see some hands clapping, so I'll do that as well. Um, Monisha is our uh, Director of Early Childhood Strategy. Uh, I only have two more minutes, so I can't say everything that I, I would, but you should um, go and look up Monisha's background. She is a leader here in Connecticut and nationally in early childhood work. She's been recognized for her innovation across educational models for young children, sustained high quality impacts and outcomes for young children and really a unique model of uh, holistically supporting families of young children. Um, in addition to her uh, work in Norwalk and the uh, Odyssey Learning Center, which she co-founded and is current, is, uh, has been the CEO of, which works with over 200 children in Norwalk as well as founding the Family Executive Center, which works with families of those children. She is also recognized nationally as a um, senior level researcher. She has been published on some of her unique and innovative approaches um, to uh, educational models and supporting families and ch young children in the pandemic. She has been served with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, she's served on advisory work for the National Association for the Education of Young Children. And even more than all of those impressive um, accolades, what you'll soon see is that she is really an inspiring leader. She brings so much energy to our SVP team. And I'm really looking forward to so many of our partners and SVP partners and uh, other partners getting to know Monisha. So with that, I will uh, turn it right over to her. And um, we're really looking forward to hearing from you and all of our incredible panelists. Sai, thank you so much for that amazing introduction. I feel privileged to be a part of the SVP team as the newest member and as the, as the director of Early Childhood Strategy. Um, welcome to everyone who's here today. I see so many familiar faces and new faces. It's so wonderful to see each of you. This position that I serve in with SVP is responsible for working with the Office of Early Childhood, as well as diverse stakeholders, to develop and support the execution of a comprehensive statewide early childhood plan that will transform the early childhood sector in Connecticut. SVP works to support and facilitate change makers and coalition builders committed to closing the opportunity gap at the systemic community and nonprofit organizational levels through non profit capacity building, systems capacity building, and community engagement in the early care and childhood sector. I'm fortunate to serve in this position uh, and play a critical role in the statewide plan for accessible, affordable, high quality care. Today, I am more than honored to have three incredible panelists. Each of these panelists play an active role in system change work in Connecticut. I'm going to start off by introducing Dr. Monette Ferguson, who is the executive director of the Alliance for Community Empowerment. Her organization serves as a model organization, not just for our state, but also for the country. The Alliance for Community Empowerment works to eradicate poverty and serves more than 35,000 individuals annually through its broad range of services. In addition, Dr. Ferguson operates one of the largest preschool programs in the state with over 14 sites serving children ages six weeks to five years of age. So Dr. Ferguson, thank you for being here and welcome. We also have Karen Hughes. Karen Hughes is the Senior Manager for Government and Public Affairs for the LEGO Group in Washington, DC. Karen represents the LEGO Citizenship Agenda, as well as corporate and environmental social responsibility. She works across the LEGO Group to unite leading voices for change around political policy practices and with practical solutions. We are very fortunate, SVP, to 
Lego and Karen and her work because that is Karen's group and Lego, which supports this position, Director of Early Childhood Strategy. So thank you, Karen, for being with us. And lastly, we have Ava Bermudez Zimmerman of CSEA SEIU 2001, Child Care and Organizing Director, representing over 2,000 family child care providers. She also serves as the co chair of the Child Care for Connecticut's Future, a statewide coalition coalition of partners, parents, advocates, business owners. We are so fortunate to have her working on a long-term transformational change for Connecticut's child care system. Zimmer, uh, Ava's work precedes her because she has been a leader in CT's fight for the 15 minimum wage and the state dreamers bill. We are so happy, Ava, to have you as well. And thank you so much. We know that right now in Connecticut, we're still faced with um, challenges in the field of early care and education. The field is offensively compensated. The current worker shortage combined with the inability to appropriately compensate teachers have made it nearly impossible to attract and retain a qualified staff. Preschool pro programs across the state continue to close. And we know that communities struggle with a lack of infant toddler shortages. We hope that today, when you hear from our speakers, that you will be able to understand the role that you can play or just have a greater understanding of what is happening in the field and what has been done. I'm going to get started with Karen. Karen, thank you so much for being here. My first question to you is, what does advocacy for early childhood and education look like from LEGO's perspective? And how does supporting the Director of Early Childhood Strategy fit into that? Thanks so much, Manisha. Thank you for hosting this. Uh, thanks to SVP for, for having uh, this great collection of folks here and uh, really honored to, to be here today. Um, so the Lego group might not need uh, much introduction. We make uh, toys. Um, you don't want to step on them in your bare feet. Um, the Lego group itself is a global organization headquartered in uh, Bielund, Denmark. Uh, we were founded in 1932 uh, by the family, the Christiansen family, which is now in its fourth generation of ownership. Um, family ownership and I think also the collective community at the Lego group are really helping the company to continue to be a values-led and values-driven organization with children at the heart of every decision that we make. Um, many people don't know that 25% of our profits every year go to the Lego Foundation. And the Lego Foundation is committed to reaching children globally with high quality learning through play opportunities. This ranges from interventions in humanitarian uh, locations, it ranges to developing of materials, research, and innovation uh, that reaches parents and children around the world uh, in the classroom, at home. Uh, and the goal is to make sure that children have access to high quality playful learning experiences that help them develop a breadth of skills. Uh, and we know that there is no more important time than the first six years of a child's life when all of those neural connections are being made in the brain. And children learn through play naturally. Children are out in the world playing and in a guided play context, they learn even better. Um, so we're really committed in a, in a number of ways, um, both through our product development design, our um, curriculum development through our subsidiary Lego education, um, and through our philanthropy and community footprint to reaching children at every age. And in the earliest stages, we've, we've made a, a range of commitments, um, including it's the 90th anniversary of the Lego group this year. Uh, and we recently announced um, a new challenge. It's a 900, Danish cro 900 million Danish kroner uh, challenge to organizations around the world to propose innovative solutions that will help to scale and reach children with high quality playful learning in the early years. Um, that translates to or converts to about $143 million that will go to five different organizations. Um, we've also been quite active uh, in the Connecticut community for many years, um, including uh, work through our local community engagement fund, um, where we partner with organizations throughout Connecticut um, we donated more than a million dollars to COVID relief um, and have partnered with the Connecticut Department for Children and Families, um, doing workshops for um, the folks at that department to help integrate playful learning into the way that um, children uh, who run through that system are reached and cared for. 
uh, and also helping parents uh, across the board um, understand the importance of playful learning and the role that playing with their children uh, plays in how, uh, how children develop and learn. Um, I wanted to bring to the attention of this group a program um, called Prescriptions for Play. Um, this is a pediatrician focused support program where pediatricians can sign up to receive materials, coaching and continuing medical education credits. Uh, for integrating playful learning into how they um, coach and counsel parents during well-being visits for children as young as 18 months. Um, I'll drop some resources in the chat uh, after, um, after I'm done. Uh, and I really encourage folks to, to check that program out because uh, it's free for pediatricians. Uh, and we really hope that it helps uh, deliver um, better resources to parents um, all over the country and especially in Connecticut. And finally, you know, we're really, really honored to be partnered with Social Venture Partners, um, a, you know, to support the Office on Early Childhood and the strategy program there. Um, we as an employer and also as a, a committed corporate citizen know that there is a lot of work to be done in the childcare and pre-K space. Uh, and we want to be a part of that solution. So thanks for having me. And uh, yeah, that's, that's our commitment to early childhood. Thank you so much for all that wonderful information. Karen, we have a little bit more time with you. I mean, can you talk a little bit about the challenges that employees are facing related to childcare and then the role that you think businesses can play in, in helping to shape the field of ECE? Yeah, so the, the, the challenges associated with childcare differ depending on what kind of business you are, depending on what kind of shift work uh, your employees are engaged in, um, whether you have a mostly sort of nine to five corporate um, employee footprint, whether you have folks working overnight, obviously they're gonna have different needs uh, when it comes to childcare. So we're not a unified block, employers aren't, um, but we all have a vested interest in making sure that uh, everyone has access to high quality um, child care. I think we know overall, um, and I, I probably don't have to tell this crowd, that um, you know, after COVID, we have not seen women return to the workplace in the same uh, numbers as before. And a lot of that is attributable to um, you know, lack of access to, to child care. Um, that has made recruitment difficult for businesses across the country. We've seen a slow labor market recovery, causing staff shortages and labor shortages um, everywhere. Um, Additionally, you know, as we see, especially corporate salary positions begin to move to remote or partial remote, we also have a challenge of meeting the, meeting the needs of employees um, from a physical location standpoint. So, for example, the Lego Group has an on-site child care facility in Enfield, um, but a lot of our employees are working in Western Mass or they're working in the Hartford area. Um, and they may not want to travel all the way to Enfield to put their uh, child in child care. It may not be practical. It's not near their partners. Um, it's hard to pick the kids up from daycare. And so they opt for other uh, solutions. And so even the, the facilities that we're able to provide may not be providing the biggest benefit um, to, to our employees. Um, as, as Monisha said, as you said, Monisha, I am sitting in Washington, DC. So I often am thinking about federal uh, issue areas. And one of the things that makes this difficult that we'd love to see change at the federal level uh, is that childcare tax credits um, for employers really incentivizes on-site childcare and a little bit more flexibility in how employers are uh, incentivized to make sure that employees have access um, would be really helpful, I think, overall. And then in terms of how we can all work together in the business community to support early childcare, I mean, I think, you know, we, we really need to be thinking about this as both the short-term and a long-term problem, right? So short-term, it's a labor challenge, right? It's important to make sure that everyone's children is, every, every child is cared for, um, that our current and prospective employees have what they need uh, for their families. It's also critical that every child has equitable access to high quality care because we're thinking about the workforce of the future and we cannot be missing those early years. So I would, you know, I think it's really important for legislators in particular to hear from businesses. Um, it, if we need to be talking about it mostly in a workforce context, I think that's great. Um, you know, I think we're also committed to, to the right thing there too, where it's like we as a society need to be taking care of families and children. Uh, and it's critical that businesses play a role because we are a key member of the community. Wow, 
That was amazing. Thank you so much. I think our businesses, all of us, have heard great things that we can take away and actually have some action steps for, for how we can contribute to this work. Thank you so much, Karen. I Thank wanted you. to um, certainly move on to Ava Bermudez Zimmerman. Um, Ava, welcome. You are a leader in this state. I would love for you to talk a little bit about the work of the coalition, some of the gains that have been made, and what the primary message is of the field that you're hearing is right now. Well, first and foremost, thank you for having me, SVP, Lego, for uh, making sure that we had the wonderful Monisha Gibson here to facilitate and be part of this uh, conversation uh, long term this year. So. I do want to point out that my background is a group of uh, parents and providers rallying to make sure that we have funding for early education. And if anyone on, on right now live or watching this later on has not heard of the event that we had on March 12th, then I don't know where you were hiding or what, what rock you were under because we were out there. For the first time, we made history here in Connecticut. And the we in that is childcare and early educators coming together and demanding for significant changes and financial help to, to change the conversation on how we fund early education. Uh, COVID was not the beginning of a childcare crisis. That, that's not where the conversation started. Prior to COVID, a common misconception when it comes to maybe legislators or parents who, um, or, or people who are not parents is well child care is should be done by moms or child care should be done by the parents at home and and sure you know there's parents at home and there's mothers out there single or family nucleus that do decide to stay home with their child and that's wonderful and that's great and no one no one's saying that you don't have to do that if that is your choice but there is a whole course of action that has to be done to support those parents who do not have the capability of staying home who do have full-time jobs who do have uh, to find um, local and hopefully accessible childcare for their child. And when we're talking about those systems in place to support that childcare, right now funding is not available to a lot of organizations, a lot of childcare centers and home-based care, which in turn then puts that parent that maybe works for Lego or other companies in a bind, right? Luckily, companies like Lego they, they're leaders in the conversation, but not each business owner has that ability to say, you know what, we're gonna pay for childcare. We're gonna make sure that every employee working for us has access to early education. So for those corporations that don't have it or the mom and pop um, that are left in the lurch, left out of the conversation, then the parent has to make that difficult decision. Do I stay home or do I find my, my own mom, you know, grandma? and grandpa or my aunt or my uncle to figure things out while I'm trying to go to work. So that was the rally that we had. That was on March uh, 12th. But how did we get there, right? How do we get to this conversation? And I mentioned COVID not being the beginning. The beginning, I would say, probably 40 years ago, when the work system, how the United States and including Connecticut shifted from primarily men being the workforce to then women coming into the workforce, coming into their own and seeing that they can also bring home the bacon, bring home uh, enough uh, to support a family of one, two, three children. And every subsequent year, uh, we've been having that conversation of opportunities to make sure that you can continue doing them. And then the last 10 years, what we've been seeing is a decline of about 30% of the workforce in early education no longer being there, cease to exist. And the top reason why they're no longer there is because the funding isn't there. We're asking of our early educators, go get an associate's degree. You know, it's part of our mandates, part of our regulations, go get an, a bachelor's degree, early education, have those CEUs every single day and go through the background check. And we wanna have those, those credentials there to support our children, but we don't put money in front of those credentials. We don't prioritize their own livable wage to make it happen. So if you're an early educator and you love what you do and you love the little kids, and then you go into this career after going to school and you're paying, you're paying your, your student loans, you take a step back and when you wanna raise your own family, you realize, I can't bring home the bacon. I can't bring home a, you know, I can't pay the bills. I can't pay my car. Um, I can't afford 
to be in this job that I love doing because I only get paid $24,000 and I have two kids of my own. So let me take a step back and find another avenue for my talents where I can at least survive. And that was happening 10 years prior to COVID conversation. And each single year, here we are as advocates reminding that we have a crisis to legislators and saying that we have a problem. So COVID was the, the cherry on top of things dismantling. It was the first um, look into, for the average person, into this crisis that wasn't really discussed anywhere. And in, in the nationwide conversation, uh, corporations were also realizing that they should be part of the conversation. Um, I, I have to single out Lego. Uh, Lego was up on this conversation years ago. <laughs> they were not new to this conversation in COVID. Um, and this is not me being, um, uh, I, I know we're giving shout outs to Lego, but they, the shout outs are due because they were, uh, they were part of this conversation very early on. But during COVID, we, for the first time, the, the we of the coalition uh, were able to come together. And it, it was a beautiful thing where um, organizations like Circle, organizations here like All Our Kin, that's also um, in, in New York and Philadelphia, they have other locations. Uh, the union covered, the union that I represent, CFCA, the Alliance, uh, the Early Childhood Alliance and Cause, Middlesex Coalition, all of these different organizations that tend to advocates every single year for these um, efficiencies, for these funding, uh, for this funding, we were able to come together during COVID, realize that we can't do it alone, and then create a, a you know, statewide, very diverse group of over 60 organizations saying, we're going to finally pair up those center providers we're gonna pair up those home-based providers, those group home providers, and connect them with parents on the ground to make these changes. So for the first time ever, that culminated to this giant rally where we had 1,400 participants at 10 different locations. Every inch of our state was well represented at this event. And we, we dubbed it a morning without childcare, allowing flexibility for those center owners, for those parents to decide how they wanted to participate. So some did, you know, take a field trip to their town greens and shut down for a few hours. Others didn't have the ability to shut down, but then participated in social media. And because of our effort, we now have a nationwide day of action. Uh, the organization Community for Change reached out to us and they said, we want to do what you did. How did Connecticut do that? How, how did you get so much media and you were even in national news, your small state? Well, we did that because we came together. We had these conversations and we didn't do it in bubbles. We didn't do it in silos and we put aside our differences. Because believe me, if you're part of the early ed conversation, um, everyone wants a little piece of the pie and sometimes it's a, a very different piece. So we had to put aside our differences and realize again, that we are stronger together. And then now we're getting that national attention. Before we did the rally in our legislative session, we only had one legislative bill that was being championed by um, Representative Sanchez. And he, he's a, a yearly champion of early ed. And then we had seven different legislative bills that were created after the rally. So that is direct impact and proof that when you do something, when you're big, when you're bold, when you're sharing your truth, people do listen. And now we're looking at close to the end of session, successes that are, are almost guaranteed. We're almost there in the home stretch and we're, we're, we haven't given up our efforts um, that we're gonna get something. You know, we've had these conversations that we're gonna get something and something is more than nothing. And we live to fight another day, hopefully um, in the long term of this for Connecticut, in four years, I hope to report in the next Lunch and Learn uh, four years from now that we have 2.5 billion and we have a universal child care system, but, but we'll see. We'll keep up the, the pressure, but that's more or less how we got to where we are and just explaining the picture and explaining the efforts that we've been doing here in advocacy.
Ava, on, on behalf of providers and leaders and businesses, we want to say thank you. And I think you said it best, uh, be, be big and bold, understanding that we are stronger together. So thank you for that message. It was powerful. Thank you for how you have conveyed what is being done, what was done, and what still needs to be done. So thank you so much. We are now going to transition to Dr. Monette Ferguson of the Alliance in Bridgeport. And I'm so excited to have her here today um, as she touches so many areas, but most importantly, the work that is being done with our families and our children. Um, Dr. Ferguson, can you speak a little bit about the biggest challenges, challenges facing parents, centers, and teachers? I know it's a big question, but you're, you're there and you're, you're, you're doing all of this work on the ground. Can you speak to that first? Oh, I, I absolutely will. Well, first of all, I'd like to just thank you, uh, Director Gibson, for giving me an opportunity to represent uh, such an integral part of how this work gets done. Um, I see my peers on this screen, three pages of folks that I've had the the benefit and the blessing of working with together, Ava, good to see you again, uh, over the years to build, uh, build better for parents. Um, and now we're at a pivotal moment in history and where we can make history. So I am happy to be here um, and I am ready to dig in. Uh, we have been working on the ground floor with parents, uh, the most vulnerable families in Bridgeport and the surrounding area, we're gonna be marking almost 60 years here at our agency. And, um, and things have changed in some areas and they haven't changed in others. And a pandemic sure didn't do us much good here in, in Bridgeport in the surrounding area. I must say from uh, center-based care, uh, I know I have sisters and brothers that do home-based care and all types of great graded services together to support families. And for us, one of the biggest barriers is staffing. I know I'm preaching to the choir to a lot of folks on the, on, on the call, and it was a vulnerable system before the pandemic. And I think Ava brought that to light. Uh, the system needed revamping and needed rebuilding and it needed attention. TLC, what we give families every single day, that tender love and care, we did not receive that as providers generally across the state because it was a given that we would make it happen because we always had. Um, that system shattered, shattered, broken to pieces with the pandemic. And, and the, the biggest, I, I would say for, for us here in Bridgeport, um, competitive wages after the pandemic, folks could folk go somewhere and, and make more money. Um, <laughs> uh, they could you know haggle and bargain for the two, three, four dollars, and believe you me, those dollars make a difference. Uh, Ava spoke to being able to care for, not just bring home the bacon, but I remember a commercial saying, you know, we as women fry it up in a pan, right? So we're not just having to, to bring home that meal, but we are having to provide that meal for a family. And, to, and, and we know that this workforce is made up of beautiful, strong women and men who are also providers, not just to those children in that classroom, but to their families at home. So when we think about what it takes to provide money, cash money <laughs> is one of those, one of the things at the top of the list. Um, also, we think about how do we recruit and maintain? How do we recruit new folks um, and attract them to the industry? And how do we maintain folks that are already here and make it attractive to stay? Uh, we've been innovative and thoughtful. We've thought about bonuses and all types of things to try to draw folks in. And it never really seems to be enough because of that weakened foundation that we stand on. Um, here again, I speak from a, a place of opportunity. Um, I know that that weakened foundation can be built because of all these partners that are on this screen and folks that are hopeful just like I. Um, when I think about parents, what they face and what they struggle, uh, we have a child care center and a high school here in Bridgeport, and we, I, I have teenage parents that need to get to class every single day. And they're not only afraid for their self and their safety, but for their unvaccinated babies. And they're not quite sure what, what, they're, what they're gonna meet each day uh, if school will open or close due to the pandemic. Um, the unstableness and the unpredictability of this pandemic 
has created, uh, I would say, beyond anxiety for my parents. Um, again, needing to earn, needing to have stability and scheduling in order for them to earn and maintain, maintain some type of uh, regularity, which has been shaken throughout the pandemic. Uh, also, we have parents that can make a choice. Do I spend money on childcare? Do I, when I'm working from home, when I probably need to be concentrating, but I need to save a few extra dollars, or I need to save all these dollars to provide for my family, and I could just have little Johnny or Jill stay home, um, knowing that we may not have that socialization, that, that great experience that my friend from Lego was talking about. Um, I, I grew up playing with Legos. I see you got some in the background. I don't know if that's real or fake, but I also know that you should not step on them. Um, <laughs> if you value <laughs> the bottom of your souls, right? Um, but we know that there is value in socialization. There's value in play, but we gotta, we gotta really work with parents to massage that relationship, to get that mindset back into either a home base or a center-based setting, because it's not all good for parents who do not trust or do not understand the environment that they are allowing their children to go back into. Um, when, we, when I think about teachers, the, the first thing that comes to mind is mental health. My staff is my community. I am my community. So when I think about what my teachers are going through, it's the same thing we're all going through. That heightened level of anxiety, fear, and sometimes just disbelief about what's going on around us. Uh, my teachers need to know that they are supported, not just financially, but also spiritually, health-wise. Everything that they go through, they need to know that they're not going to get a side eye and be questioned because we think differently of them because it's a pandemic. Um, we've always, always had vulnerable staff working in our classrooms, not because they want to make a million dollars, but because they love what they do. Um, I, I often tell the story that my preschool teacher still works for my agency. My preschool teacher has dedicated 48 years of her life to early childhood education. I often think how in God's green earth did she raise a family on what we provide here? But I also make it my business to make sure that she is earning more than she did when she started <laughs> back then, which is not easy in this climate. Um, also, we think about motivation. What gets folks up every single day? Our parents, our teachers, um, our partners. What motivates folks to get up every single day and push forward and try to do better in spite of the challenges that this industry is facing? And we think about motivation. We think about these children. We think about these smiles. We think about the parent that needs that extra good morning. Uh, that's what early childhood always brought to every situation that TLC, that extra tender love and care. So now here we are asking for the same benefit from our legislatures, from our business partners. And it's not all, sometimes it's not all dollars and cents. Sometimes it's just the ability to listen and innovate and to lend yourself as a thought partner. Big shout out to Lego, Director Gibson and SVP for having the foresight to put this, this, this talk together to really think about what will it take we all have innovations. I consider myself a leader in this field and I have considered every option, I believe, <laughs> in order to continue to make this work, but not just make it work. We need to make it stronger and make it better for the next generation of parents and providers so they don't have to go through this. God forbid another pandemic or natural disaster or anything we have to go through, there has to be a blueprint. We can't keep trying to piece things together with duct tape. Duct tape is cool but it doesn't last forever. So we really wanna be more thoughtful. Again, shout out to our partners at SVP. Um, these type of talks and situations really build strength, not just with the process, but also with the product. Um, I hope I answered your question, Director Gibson. Dr. Ferguson, you more than answered the question. I think that, you know, you are speaking truth to power. I, I think that when you talk about make it stronger, make it better, we're tired of the duct tape. Um, I think it was very clear. You know, I'd like you to talk about one more question because you hit it on the nose when you talked about, yeah, you are a leader. You are an innovative leader. Um, but so many 
of our colleagues in the field struggled during this time. So many of our colleagues had to close their doors. Can you talk a little bit about the advice that you would give to leaders about how to best um, navigate this current climate? What are some things that, that leaders in the field can do? Um, absolutely, and that every situation is different, um, but I lean shoulder in, lean on partnerships. And I would express deeply that my peers across the state do the same thing. Um, partnerships, not just with the large organizations and the large businesses, but with your neighbor. Um, this year, my slogan for my organization is Alliance is a good neighbor. We think about all state, we think about all these slogans that talk about being a good neighbor, but what is really a good neighbor? A good neighbor has that cup of sugar when you need it. A good neighbor has that loaf of bread when you're a little short or that peanut butter when you only have jelly. So we're talking about good neighboring in a way that supports each other when we can't support ourselves. OEC has taken on a good neighbor role. Lego has taken on a good neighbor role. SVP, and I could go on and on and on. But when we think about local partnerships, I believe that there is considerable strength and neighboring each other. In addition to that, I, I, I really strongly stand on uh, the principle of being transparent and bring as open and honest and communicative as possible with parents and with staff. The more you know, the more we can grow. It doesn't serve any of us any good to be secretive, to be um, you know, back office chatting and all that great stuff because when folks are anxious, and they're scared, they don't move forward and they do not engage. And that is something that we always need to consider. When folks feel like they can have a relationship and they can be trusted and listened to, things begin to move forward. Um, also, the, the same flexibility and innovation that we share here at Alliance, I know my peers across the state share. It is no secret that early childhood education has pieced together bit by bit over the last few decades. Continue to do what you do, but do it in partnership and create best practices so you can pass on that information to your neighbor who may need it tomorrow. I know for a fact that it is not just one person that could do any of this work. You're all a, a prime example of what it takes to move this needle forward for our families here in Connecticut. When we think about economy, I have a lot of peers and friends that know we cannot move the economy without childcare, quality childcare, not just any childcare. Nobody's just gonna leave their kids anywhere. So as we begin to market ourselves and really begin to build our, what we know to be true about ourselves as providers, it creates a broader picture for the economy because they need us way, way more than they ever realized prior to a pandemic. So those, I think, are the key points, that flexibility, innovation, communication, openness, uh, and partnership, above all. Could I echo some, uh, some of those sentiments, uh, Monisha? Is that okay? That, Absolutely. Uh, I'm a good neighbor, and I love how you phrase that, Dr. Ferguson. Uh, people asked us, um, different organizations, about eight different organizations nationwide, reached out to, to CCFCT, our coalition, after the rally, saying, how did you do it, and how did you... Um, organize it in just two weeks. And it's the good neighbor. I, I've never framed it that way, but our jobs as advocates or providers, right? Providers on the field, there's a, a degree of trust. You're, you're asking strangers in that first relationship that you're creating, right? You're asking them, parents, to trust you, trust you with their child. And as advocates, we're asking childcare providers and parents to trust us to, to help guide a path where we could all be successful. And if we didn't have that good neighbor mentality, if we didn't have that trust already built after years of talking about the subject, being in this field, we wouldn't have been able to pull off anything in just two weeks. That is truly the key, that, that connectivity of having that trust in hand and saying, we will give you that cup of sugar when you need that cup of sugar, because you never know when you do need the cup of sugar yourself. That's a reality. We don't do this alone. It, it truly takes a village. I, it feels like all of these idioms seem cliche, 
or maybe slightly a little bit uh, uh, corny, if I may say. But in early education, well, we can be a little fun with the way that we phrase things because we're working with children. But there is a lot of truth to the fact that what we do and what providers do, they're not just there educating children. They're cooking. They're feeding, right? They're also therapists. They're providing, providing all of these social services. And there's also a comment that was in the chat from Dorothy Adams, where she mentioned stable and predictable work schedules, right? And pointing out that not everyone has a predictable work schedule. Not every parent has the, the ability to go pick up their child at 5 p.m. or 4 p.m. That's a child care provider and child care center and home-based providers going above and beyond as an extended family member to provide those resources. There's also after-school care. There's also summer care. When you think about early education, don't just think about an um, eight to four or an eight to three program. Think about every person encircling your family that's saying, I trust you, you trust me, and we're extending our family so we can make sure that we're successful together. That's early education. Wow. I mean, I am just, well, let me just say, SVP, we're a good neighbor. Just think of us. I mean, I think, Dr. Ferguson, the analogy and the picture that you can paint, really, this is really about, let's go back to the basics of how we helped one another. And it takes all of us. I've heard it over and over from each panelist. It takes all of us to play a role in moving this work forward. One person can't do it alone. We are so grateful that each of you um, spent time with us today. I would like you to stay with us a little bit longer so that we can actually turn over to our guests um, if they have any questions for any of our panelists. Um, and so at this time, we are going to open up um, our conversation for all of you who have taken time out of your lunch to join us to see if there are any questions that any of our panelists can answer for you. So um, Scott has put in, hi Scott, has put into the chat, it seems clear that the business model for ECE is broken. Many parents, guardians will never be able to pay what it takes to cover the true cost of quality care, accreditation, training, uh, livable wages for child care workers. Therefore, there is little incentive for the supply of child care spots to meet the demand. Is there any way to bridge the funding gap without significant government support? Great question. Uh, Ava. <laughs> I will, I will so take that. that. And, Sorry, and go up. <laughs> um, Scott, you're absolutely, absolutely right. Uh, there, there is a true breakdown in the system, and we can't always expect that the federal government's going to bail us out. You're, you're absolutely right about that. In the conversations that we've had as a coalition, and I'm sure a lot of organizations have had, um, there's fear of asking for the everyday person, everyday uh, resident, to pay for more in their taxes and expect that taxes are gonna fix um, our early ed woes. But there has been some creative solutions this legislative session on how to get us there with um, additional money that we've gotten through the revenue cap uh, that uh, grows every single year that we don't use that money. And in um, five years, it will be $16 billion. And that $16 billion is not being allocated for any one thing. That 16 billion will just be sitting there uh, recurring more interest. And part of our legislative plan, our ask is saying, can we use that money and specifically have it line item for early education? With that kind of funding, we will be able to revamp and not have to raise taxes and not ask for a federal bailout. If a federal bailout does come, phenomenal. We will welcome it. Connecticut will be very uh, resourceful in how we use it. Um, but on the other end, right? Part of his question is how do we not depend on, on government intervention? Well, that means that we have to have the deep and more difficult conversation with businesses and parents of how do you want to fund childcare and what does it look like? Right now, only 20% of childcare in the state of Connecticut is funded by federal subsidies or state subsidies. That could be a Head Start program, it could be Care for Kids, a childcare subsidy for low income parents. 
So when you're talking to a child care center or a child care setting, most of the time, a good portion of the cost is coming from the parents and it's coming specifically from the child care center themselves. And we're not really there yet when we're talking to businesses on how much would they be willing to put in to pay for childcare and ensure that you're in a competitive workforce and you're getting more employees in. So I have personally spoken in these conversations with childcare centers that they're putting in 10, 15% of their own revenue, um, finding funds through grants and finding other resources to fund and, and fuel their own childcare setting, and then giving those grants to those parents who are not necessarily low income. They could be just middle class everyday people, but because childcare is so expensive, $14,000 a year, the cost of a college degree to UConn, they just are at the tipping point. And those childcare centers are supplementing the cost to make sure that their child is being cared for. So it has to be a more cohesive plan. We have to have those honest conversations with parents. What are you willing and a, a truly available to pay for? With the child care center, what do you need and what resource can we help you to make sure that you stay alive? With the government, be it federal or state, saying, can we find solutions that are practical? And with the business owners, are you willing to have this conversation with us and not walk away? Because this is everyone's problem. It's not just a parent's problem. I'll just throw in that I dropped in the chat a link to a, a program in Michigan called TriShare, where they've they found various pots of money within the, the state budget, and they're splitting the cost of child care three ways, one third um, from the employee, one third from an employer, and one third from the state funds. I think, you know, the way that they've funded it, there's long-term sustainability challenges associated with it, but the business community was really, really pivotal in pulling together that program. They sort of, I, I spoke to the Chamber of Commerce and the business was basically stormed at the Chamber of Commerce and said, we have to have a solution. How are we gonna do this? And then the Chamber of Commerce played a pivotal role in brokering that with the state government. Um, so I'd love to, you know, you know, I don't know if any of my fellow uh, Connecticut employers are on the phone, but this is somewhere where I really think that like, we've got to figure out what that business position is around this and, and what's possible and, and just full support for, for Ava's point. Thank you both Karen and Ava for that. Um, we have another question in the chat from Yolanda. Hi, hello, Yolanda. Um, can any of the speakers address the need for childcare during non-traditional hours between 5 p.m. and 7 a.m.? I can definitely. I see you from Dr. Hi, Yolanda. Uh, long time no. <laughs> I can't really see you, but <laughs> great to great to virtually see you. Um, so we actually, there you are. <laughs> um, we actually understand that we needed to uh, pivot and to address the real needs of, of families on, on the ground floor. And again, that speaks to that flexibility and innovation that I spoke of earlier. So the first thing I did, and I have staff, I have a staff in children. I have 13 classrooms closed right now out of almost 80, uh, which is way better than it was a year ago. We have made leaps and bounds, but we are not there. So the first thing I had to do is make sure I had human resources to serve from seven from five to seven or Saturdays or Sundays, whatever we think could draw folks in to this industry, draw folks back into this industry. And we just did not have uh, the response that we needed from existing staff members to extend that day. Um, some of them were willing to give up the Monday and work Tuesday through Saturday, but they also wanted to be compensated at a greater amount for the shift. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a great idea to say, hey, let's just do this. But when you think about the practicality and the strategizing around that, the workforce is not ready for that shift. I could say maybe family care providers may be a little more nimble with that, and they have been. They have answered the call when clearly an alliance cannot because of the hours of operation that we have. Um, but for center base, from what I'm speaking right now, at this point in time, always hopeful, but at this point in time, it is it would be a work in progress to get to those, those more flexible extended hours for parents. From, the, from my union hat that I also wear, the, the home-based perspective, um, SEIU has right now 
um, a handful of centers that we represent here in the state of Connecticut that are unionized and, and other locals also have uh, unionized centers, but we represent 2000 um, unionized home-based providers. Now that 2000 in the last four years has decreased by a thousand people. So when, when I started organizing early education 10 years ago and they got their first child child contract or collective bargaining agreement for home-based providers, we were looking at close to 4,000. And then in the last 10 years, because of lack of salary, even though we've been negotiating raises with the state of Connecticut through the Care for Kids program, again, it's not enough to keep people in the workforce to make that sacrifice. And the sacrifice that Dr. Ferguson mentioned about those non-traditional hours often is a sacrifice that home-based providers are, are creating. They're, they're saying, hey, to my own child, hey, hey, husband, or hey, partner, um, I know that we have a child care setting in our home, but in addition to me usually getting up at 8 a.m., or no, who am I kidding, getting up at 5 a.m. <laughs> to, to have kids at 8 a.m., um, let's extend those hours to 7 p.m., which often was a conversation that was happening during COVID. So when centers were rapidly closing, because by the way, if you didn't know, if you don't hit at least 80% capacity in a child care center setting, you're at the brink of, of closing down. If, if you do that consistently every single month for a few months, you're bankrupt. So the ratios really depend on how big your space is. And for home-based providers, those ratios are very different, right? When you have a child care center setting, it's how large, how many kids you can fit in, the state comes in and they, they, they analyze with you. In a home-based setting, you're maxed out at six kids during the day, plus three for after school or non, you know, hours that do not interfere with the, the school system. So there, there is a max capacity there. So technically, if you are at full capacity, you theoretically can run a business without having to worry as much about bankruptcy in the next two, three months of not being at capacity if you have a safety net through a partner or someone else living in that house because that's your own house, right? You're paying a mortgage. But at the end of the day, that comes with the sacrifice of knowing that you're giving your own personal space and you're extending your hours to be more flexible to parents because you wanna have a, a business that is flourishing. And that's often the conversation that we've heard from parents. It's wonderful that that flexibility is there but it comes with a lot of sacrifice. Thank you for that insight, Dr. Ferguson and Ava and Karen. I mean, I can't believe we're already down to four minutes left. I, I mean, I really appreciate and I want to thank um, not only our amazing panelists, um, Karen Hughes, um, certainly Dr. Ferguson and Ava Zimmerman, uh, Bermuda Zimmerman. I, I just think that there was a lot that was learned here. Um, I certainly have to shout out the people who are behind the scenes who you may or may not know. Um, Martha Mincer, I want to thank you for all the coordination for this entire event. Um, your work was effortless in helping us to bring this about. So thank you so much. Camille, you all don't see her. We have an incredible team of people at SVP who help us get this work done. I see Sky there, and we see a lot of our my colleagues from SVP on the call. We want to sincerely say thank you. We hope that you have learned something. I know I certainly have. We have brought you the best that we could. While there are others in this state who are also the best, um, I want to appreciate, I want to personally take these individuals because we know that they directly have influenced um, SVP. So I know that um, it is time for all of you to um, gain three more minutes back of your lives. I am going to hang on. Um, to just answer any questions that people may have, but I want to be respectful um, of everyone who is here. I certainly see the Norwalk community representing as well. So good to see all of my great friends from Norwalk, um, great providers, Rovita Paul, I see you, and I know that Jennifer as well. So I just want to thank everyone who's here. If there are no further questions, all of you can feel free to leave. I will hang around for a little bit more. This will be posted and recorded for the next couple of days. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you.